I want to kick us off today with a quick story. I was setting up for a workshop recently for a corporate client, and one of the participants came up to me before we got started, and he wanted to share a project that he'd heard about that he was hoping to replicate. This participant wanted to build an algorithm that would create a unique color combination for something like thousands of different segments within a given graph. Now, he recognized that thousands of different segments was probably overkill, so he was going to set his cap at something like 200. So 200 different combinations of varying hues and intensity, so never would the same colors appear next to each other twice. Now, he was so excited about this that I didn't have the heart to tell him at that point that color can usually be used more strategically than that. Now, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here, the algorithm that he wanted to build would allow the user to easily create graphs that look something like this. These are pretty, but is pretty the goal when we're visualizing data? Pretty is the goal when my two and a half year old wants to use every crayon in the box. But pretty isn't the goal when we're visualizing data, or it isn't usually the primary goal when we're communicating with data. Now, I like to think that as I talked through the various lessons in the workshop that day, that I saw a new understanding forming with this participant. Color, when used sparingly and strategically, is one of your most powerful tools for drawing your audience's attention to where you want them to pay it. Now, this is one piece of advice I find myself giving perhaps more than any other. Be thoughtful and intentional when it comes to your use of color. Don't ever let your tool or an algorithm make this important decision for you. So today, to really drive this point home, I'm going to talk through several lessons on color. I want to draw one distinction at this point, which is the distinction between exploratory analysis and explanatory analysis. So I'm assuming in our conversation here that you've already explored your data. You already know what's interesting about it that you want to communicate to somebody else. So we're in that explanatory analysis space where you have something specific you want to communicate to somebody specific. So have that lens on as we're talking through these lessons. Specifically, we'll go through seven brief lessons. Start off by talking about how attention-grabbing color can be and how we can use that attention-grabbing power to signal to our audience via color where to look. But to work as a signal, color has to be used sparingly. Color can carry quantitative value. It can also carry tone and meaning. But not everybody sees color the same way. And finally, we'll talk about how color can be used, should be used consistently. So let's kick this off with how color can grab our attention. I'm going to start off by talking briefly about how people see. This is a super simplified picture of that process. On the left-hand side, we have light refracting off a stimulus. This gets captured by our eyes. We don't fully see with our eyes. Rather, it's what happens in the brain that we think of as visual perception takes place. Now, in the brain, there are a few types of memory that are important to understand as we are communicating with data. And we're going to focus on one of those today, which is iconic memory. Iconic memory is super short-term. It's shorter than short-term memory, and information stays there for fractions of a second before it gets forwarded on to our short-term memory. The really cool thing about iconic memory is that it's tuned to a specific set of what we call pre-attentive attributes. Pre-attentive attributes are huge tools in our visual design tool belt. So let's actually pause here and do a little exercise. So in a moment, I'm going to put a bunch of numbers up on the screen. What I'd like you to do, as fast as you can, is count the number of sevens that you see. Note your process as you're doing this. All right, ready, set, go. The correct answer is five, but this was sort of tough. Not technically difficult, but you have to physically read through these four lines of text, look for the shape seven, check out what a different exercise it is when we make one tiny change. This is important because what this tells us is our pre-attentive attributes. Here I'm using pre-attentive attribute of color or hue to make the sevens the one thing that are different from the rest. 
which means that you pick up on that cue without even really knowing that that's what's happening. It's before you have time to blink, before you have time to think. Now this is super important because what this tells us is our pre-attentive attributes, specifically color, can be used to help us enable our audience to see what we want them to see before they even know they're seeing it. Here are the attributes. I won't talk through all of these, but notice as your eye scans across the screen, how it's just drawn to the one shape within each group that's different from the rest. You don't really have to devote any conscious thought to looking for it. Now, two of the pre-attentive attributes here are attributes of color. Hue, which is what we typically think of as color, red, blue, green, yellow, and intensity, which is varying levels of saturation of a given color. Now, one thing to keep in mind with the pre-attentive attributes is some carry quantitative assumptions and others do not. So for example, when it comes to hue, if I ask you which is greater red or green, this isn't a meaningful question. And this is important because it tells us which of the pre-attentive attributes can be used to encode quantitative information and which should be used as categorical differentiators. So hue is typically used as a categorical differentiator whereas intensity can carry with it some numeric value or assumptions of numeric value with higher intensity colors having higher numeric value and vice versa. So we'll look at a specific example of hue and intensity when it comes to visualizing information soon uh, via a heat map. But in the meantime, let's shift on to our second lesson of the day, which is about how we can take this color grabbing attention uh, that we just looked at and use color as a signal for where to look. So there's a test that I will often employ when I'm trying to determine whether I'm using my pre-attentive attributes, specifically color, well, whether I'm drawing my audience's eyes to where I want them to go. And that is via the where are your eyes drawn test, where you create your visual and you either look away from it and look back, or you close your eyes and look at it, and you just note where do your eyes go first, because probably this is where your audience's eyes will go first as well. Now I want to do this with a series of pictures and talk about some considerations with each. So just take note as I flip through these of where your eyes go first. Where do they go first? Here. Most people will go immediately to that big, bold, red stop sign at the bottom right. Um, because of the bright color, uh, because we're sort of trained over time that red means danger, pay attention, uh, because of the big, bold capital letters written on it, and then we maybe back up from there and read some of the other signs. How about where do your eyes go here? Most people will be drawn to the sun at the bottom left. But if you're like me, if you try to focus on the sun, you see the plane in your peripheral vision and pulls you a little bit there. Or if you try to focus on the plane, you see the sun in your peripheral vision and have a, some tugging going on when it comes to your attention there. And this is just to illustrate that you want to be aware of this tension that can happen if you're emphasizing multiple different things on a page or within a data visualization. Let's do another one of these. Where do your eyes go first? Here. Most people will go first to that perennial sale sign, the, the pink sign in the very middle because of the bright color, because of the big, bold black text. Now, one thing to know about visual processing is most people, when encountered with a page or a screen, without other visual cues, they'll start at the top left and do zigzagging Zs across the page or screen. In this case, though, that perennial sale sign is so uh, attention-grabbing that we start there and then continue on the Z downward to the right, also because of the arrangement of the signs there. Notice that means that we've missed whatever's happening in that top left quadrant, which is just something to be aware of as you're designing your visuals uh, and the pages that contain them. Where do your eyes go here? If you're like me, they're drawn everywhere and nowhere all at once. There are so many things competing for our attention, it's impossible to know where to look. And that's the downfall of the pretty graphs that we looked at uh, in the introduction. With so much competing for our attention, we don't have any cues of where we should look. Color can be used more strategically than this. Check out the difference between that and this. 
when the orange crayon is the one thing that's different from the rest, we can't help but look at it. We can't help but have our eyes drawn there. So I want to think about how we can leverage this attention-grabbing power when it comes to our data visualizations. First, though, let's look at how we can have color signal where to look when it comes to the use of text. Go ahead and give this text a quick scan. Now, without other visual cues, this becomes very much like the count the sevens example again, where you're faced with this block of text that you pretty much have to read and put on the lens of what's important or interesting, then maybe read the block of text again to put the important or interesting things back in context of the rest. But I can use pre-attentive attributes, color specifically we'll look at here, to direct your attention to one part in the text or another. Or I could direct your attention to multiple places in the text, help make it scannable, right? So we can have the full verbatim comments here in this example, but some pithy phrases pulled out that we can see very quickly. So we don't have to necessarily read all of the text that's there. Studies have shown we have on the order of three to eight seconds with our audience, during which time they're deciding whether they're going to continue to look at what we've put in front of them or move their attention on to the next thing. If we've used our pre-attentive attributes well, even if we only get that first three to eight seconds, we've gotten our main point across. Now, as you can imagine, pre-attentive attributes are also hugely useful when it comes to visualizing data. So I've got a few examples. First, let's imagine that you manage a bus fleet. Uh, one thing you might be interested in understanding is how cost per mile varies according to miles driven. So here we could use pre-attentive attributes to quickly draw attention to the cases where cost per mile is above average. So we can see if we drive less than about 1,700 miles a month, more than about 3,300 miles a month, our cost is above average. For another example, uh, here we're looking at survey data, customer feedback from our annual survey last year in 2014 versus this year in 2015. You can see how we've done across a number of categories. If we want to quickly draw your attention to the category where we saw a decline, we can do so through that sparing use of color. So I get one more of these. Imagine you work for a car manufacturer. One thing you might be interested in is understanding the top 10 design concerns, which is what we have listed here on the basis of concerns per 1,000. Now we could use color sparingly to draw attention to some of these. Right? We might wanna talk about some of the top design concerns, whether these are acceptable default rates, Within this group, I could further refine the story to point out some of the issues in common, perhaps paired with some explanatory text. Now, one word that I've been using throughout these examples when it comes to the use of color is sparingly, because color really only works as a cue when it's used sparingly. It's easy to spot a hawk in a sky full of pigeons. This is an analogy that Colin Ware talks about in his book, Information Visualization, uh, Perception for Design. And the analogy is, it's easy to spot a hawk in a sky full of pigeons, but as the variety of birds increases, that hawk becomes harder and harder to pick out. In other words, the more things we make different, the lesser degree to which any one of them stand out. Or if there's something that's very important, we should think about making that the one thing that's very different from the rest. Now, this idea applies very much in data visualization. Here's an example of color not used sparingly. So in this example, imagine you work for a US retailer and you're interested in understanding the distribution of your customers compared to the general population. So the segments listed down the left-hand side here could be any demographic measure, uh, age groups, for example. If we think about applying the where are your eyes drawn test here, similar to that box of crayons where there is so much competing for our attention, our eyes go nowhere and everywhere sort of at the same time. Now, if we stare at this for a while, we might notice the red box on the right and use that as a signal to say, okay, I think I'm supposed to concentrate there. I'm not totally sure why, because we don't have any context, but let's ignore that for the moment. 
Check out though how we can use the same construct, but just use our color more sparingly to make it very clear where to look. Now this example has been uh, fairly generalized so that we're not sure still why we're concentrating here, but we at least know very quickly because of the sparing use of color where we're meant to pay attention. Something to keep in mind with color is that it can carry quantitative value. We talked about this briefly when it came to hue and intensity when we were looking at pre-attentive attributes. I wanna dig into this idea a little bit more. So what we're looking at now is country level sales rank of top five drugs. So this is an example from the pharmaceutical industry. If we read the subtext at the top, it says rainbow distribution in color indicates sales rank in given country from number one in red to number 10 or higher in dark purple. So here we're using color as a categorical differentiator. If I apply the where are my eyes drawn test, I go first to number one in red, which is good, but then I go to 10 and 12 and eight, these purple and dark blues, because they're in um, higher intensity of color. But when we think about where we want our audience to pay attention, that's not necessarily the order we want them to process this information. Uh, for those of you who grew up in the 80s like me, you may appreciate this reference. This is a table that Rainbow Bright would love, uh, but I don't like it so much because we can use our color more thoughtfully than this. Specifically, instead of using color as a categorical differentiator through varying hues, we can think about varying the intensity, which does carry with it some quantitative assumptions. So in this case, I've made the market leaders the highest saturation of blue color going to the lowest saturation. So now if we consider how we process the information, I go first to the ones, then to the twos, then to the threes, and so on. This is a more thoughtful use of color. So color can carry quantitative assumptions. Color can also carry tone and meaning, which means we want to think about what is the tone that we want to set with our data visualization or with the broader communication in which our data visualizations sit and think about how we can use color to underscore that desired tone. Now, any search on Google for something like color and tone or color and meaning or color and emotion will pull up uh, visuals that look something like this. And if we look at some of these different colors, black is elegant, bold, powerful, blue, confident, classic, uh, red, aggressive, speed, danger. Uh, yellow down at the bottom. Uh, so funny story, I had a rental car uh, when I was traveling in Seattle last week and all I had to do was look at this car and it made me happy, which was sort of bizarre because you, you wouldn't expect that reaction with a car necessarily. But this particular car was a bright yellow VW Beetle. Now, I would never buy a bright yellow car, but it made me happy every time I looked at it. And when we look at yellow down here, it tends to represent things like youth, friendly, positive feelings, sunshine, and so on. Uh, we get over to the other side though, we get to hot pink, and it's expressing ideas like exciting, playful, tropical, flirtatious, which may have its place, um, probably isn't in our quarterly board report, for example. Um, so you just want to be aware of this tone and emotion that color can evoke when it comes to your data visualizations. Let's take a look at this in action. So here is a generic graph. I'm going to render it uh, in some different colors and just notice how the graph feels different when we use different color to emphasize. Uh, so I typically design my data visualizations in shades of gray and then use a medium blue very sparingly to draw attention. Uh, I like blue because you avoid colorblind issues, which we'll talk further about momentarily. Uh, it also prints well in black and white, if that's a concern. Uh, but one time I got told by a client who I'd done some makeovers for that my visuals looked too nice, as in they were too friendly. They were reporting the results of statistical analysis and were used to and desired a more clinical look and feel. So in that case, I remade my own makeovers, substituting the blue with bold black. And the graphs as a result of that simple change felt and looked totally different from the originals. 
Uh, you could think about leveraging just an outline to have an assumption of opportunity. Um, my latest blog post is actually considering that idea further. Notice that red trending upward feels like a negative thing, whereas green trending upward feels like a positive thing. Now, I've done nothing to change the actual data here. The only thing I'm playing with is color. Now, if you have a company logo or brand colors or your client has brand colors that you want to work within, that's awesome. Uh, it's one way to give personality and cohesion to the data visualizations that you create for your brand or your client's brand. Um, but if your brand is colorful, just be aware that it doesn't mean you have to use every brand color in your graph. Right? Pick one or maybe a couple brand colors to use to draw attention. Uh, and here's the flirtatious version of the graph rendered in hot pink. Slipping through a um, magazine one time and there was a sort of fluffy article on online dating. And their visuals were entirely hot pink and teal. And that worked given the sort of fluffy nature of the content. But as we mentioned before, not appropriate for something like your board report, probably. Uh, unless it's a brand color, which then is a different consideration. Now, we talked about some of the tone that color can have. One thing to be aware of is the tone, the assumed meanings associated with color can vary depending on where you grew up, where you're from. Uh, so especially in the case where you are communicating with an international audience, you want to make sure you take some of those nuances when it comes to color into account. Now, what we have in front of us now is the Colors and Culture. It's a color wheel done by David McCandless uh, that's both at the same time sort of beautiful data visualization as well as a useful tool for visualizing data. So if we look at this for a moment, uh, we are in Western American, so that's A, which is the outermost ring around the circle here. And we can look along it to see what different colors represent here. So red is 41, so red means heat. Uh, blue 39 means healing, yellow is happiness, right? Thinking back to my yellow VW uh, beetle, um, and, and so on and so forth. And so you just want to be aware of the tonal and meaning impact that color can have, both on your data visualizations as well as the broader communications in which they sit, and be thoughtful about what colors you use. Also should be thoughtful that not everybody sees color in the same way. Specifically, about 10% of the population, 8% of men and half a percent of women, are colorblind, which typically manifests itself as difficulty in distinguishing between shades of red and shades of green, which means in general we should avoid using shades of red and shades of green together. Or if you do have to use red and green together, right, if you want to leverage that, that connotation that red, it went down, that's bad, green, it went up, that's good, you can do so, but make sure you have some additional visual cues also present. Make the numbers bold. Uh, ensure that you have the plus or minus sign in front of them. Do something else to set them apart visually so you're not inadvertently disenfranchising part of your audience. Which brings us to our final lesson of the day on the consistent use of color. So if you have five sales regions and you show them in one color scheme in one place in your report or presentation, you wanna to try to maintain that same color schematic throughout the rest. If you're lucky, your audience will familiarize themselves with the details of what they're looking at once and assume those same details apply. And in general, if you can, you want to try to avoid using those same colors for other purposes. Let's look here to a recent example from the media. So these are some graphs from The Economist. They accompanied an article on the changing role of women in Latin America. Uh, and I like these graphs overall. They... Um, they're nice, they are clean looking, they do a nice job of capturing the information, but there are some slight changes that we can make that will go a long way in making them even more effective. Let's take a closer look at what we're looking at here. So the graph on the left shows labor force participation rate as a percent of total. Uh, we start with the developed countries on the left, Middle East, North Africa, East Asia and the Pacific, and then finally Latin America on the right. For each of those, we have time points in both 1990 and to 2013. 
Uh, red depicts the percentage of women in the labor force, and blue depicts percentage of men in the labor force. And one of the things I really like about this is how the gap between the two is highlighted. So we can see, for example, the gap is uh, narrowing when it comes to developed countries. Uh, in Latin America, we see a sharp increase in female participation rate in the labor force, which is awesome, um, but still falling short of males. Um, one thing, to, a couple of things to notice here. One is that women are rendered in red and men in blue. And then secondly, within Latin America, we see darker colors used to um, emphasize there, also with the bolding of Latin America, versus brighter colors were used in the other regions. Now if we come over to the right, we have our first horizontal bar graph shows women in parliament, percent of seats held, and then at the bottom, women CEOs, uh, again on a percentage basis. Now, whereas women were rendered in red on the left, now we're showing this in blue, which seems like it should be tied to men on the left, but we're talking about women, so that's contradictory. Uh, the other thing is the use of bright and dark colors are switched here. So on the left-hand side in the slope graph, Latin America was rendered in the darker colors versus on the right-hand side in the horizontal bar graphs, Latin America and the Caribbean on the top and Latin 500 on the bottom are the brighter color, not the darker color. So again, minor, but it increases the cognitive burden of the processing of this information. And there's no reason not to use consistent coloring here. So if I were remaking these visuals, I'd want to do them in red. I would want to have Latin America be what's in the darker color to make it tie back to how we're using color on the left-hand side of the visual. Now, for me, this is a little tangential, but these only tell part of the story, the way they're depicted currently. When I look at the top graph, it looks to me like Latin America and the Caribbean is doing great when it comes to percent of seats held in parliament by women. If I come down to the bottom graph, it looks like, ooh, Latin 500 not doing so well when it comes to CEOs of public companies. But if we add in the full picture, so let's add in the men component in both of these cases. Now, when I interpret this top graph, I see, yeah, Latin America and Caribbean has a higher percentage of women than these other areas, but there's still a lot of opportunity when it comes to balancing the men and women proportions in parliament. And when I come down to the bottom, no longer do I say, whoa, Latin America is doing horrible. Rather, I say, everybody's doing horrible when it comes to this. So there's room for improvement uh, everywhere. Um, yes, Latin America lags, but it doesn't lag by so much. Um, so just changes the way I interpret the numbers. And again, here, I've used blue now to tie back to the blue that was used on the left to represent men and continued with that darker emphasis of color in Latin America to tie with how color was used on the left-hand side. So that brings me to the end of our lessons on color today. Just to quickly recap, we started off by talking about how people see and how we can leverage the pre-attentive attribute of color to grab our audience's attention. We can use that attention-grabbing power to signal both in text as well as in data visualizations where our audience should look. But to be a clear cue on where to look, color needs to be used sparingly. Color can carry quantitative value, can also carry tone and meaning. So you want to think about what is the tone and meaning you want to convey with your overall data visualization or broader communication. Think about how you can use color to underscore that. Recognizing, though, that not everybody sees color in the same way, uh, and also that color should be used consistently. So what we've looked at today are just a couple key lessons. Uh, Storytelling with data, visualizing data effectively, these are much broader lessons uh, that can be covered in much, much more depth. Um, and I've actually covered them in much, much more depth in a forthcoming book uh, that will be out at the end of October called Storytelling with Data. And this will just give you a sense of what the chapter breakdown looks like within that six key lessons and then a whole lot by way of case studies and examples and insight into my design process. The lessons that we've looked at today on color are just a subset of what you'll find in chapter four on focusing attention. Uh, so if you like what you saw today, definitely check this out for many more examples and lessons when it comes to the effective use of data uh, in communicating. With that, I say a very big thank you for joining.